In today's video, we are out here with the all-new 2018 Chevy Equinox. For 2018, Chevy decided not only to completely redesign their compact crossover, but also to buck the trend of making it bigger than the last generation. This is actually 4.7 inches shorter than the previous generation Equinox and also loses about 400 pounds in terms of overall curb weight. The model we're looking at today is a top end premier trim with the two liter turbocharged engine under the hood. This engine was not available when I was first able to sample the Equinox at its launch event a number of months ago. Also not available at the launch event was Chevy's brand new 1.6 liter diesel engine, which is now available under the Equinox's hood as well. Up front, the Equinox uses Chevy's latest design language, so we have this chrome grill up front with a bar that integrates the Chevy logo. Our model has the optional 360-degree camera system, so there's one right there. But one thing you won't notice up front is a radar sensor, and that's because even though this model has the optional autonomous braking system and lane-keeping assistance, we don't find radar adaptive cruise control in any Equinox at this time. Depending on the trim level you get, there are three different headlights used. Base models use halogen headlamps, mid-level trims use HID headlamps, and because we're driving the Premier, we have full LED lamps in this model. The previous generation Equinox was sort of a half step larger than its direct rivals, but that's not the case for the 2018 model. At 183.1 inches long, this is just about the same size as the RAV4 and the CRV these days, although this is still about three inches longer than the Honda. The size reduction makes sense when you take a look at General Motors' overall crossover portfolio because they had a lot of vehicles that were right about the same size. And instead of doing that again for 2018, General Motors decided to separate the vehicles just a little bit. So the Chevy Traverse became a lot larger than it was before, leaving room for the GMC Acadia to slot between this Equinox and that Chevy Traverse. The reshuffling in size means that this is now a very, very direct competitor to things like the RAV4, the CRV, the Tucson, etc., and definitely a little bit smaller than something like a Kia Sorento, which is still in that sort of half step larger category. This is a two row crossover, not a three row crossover like the Nissan Rogue can be, and that's why we don't find the three row crossover styling that we see in that Nissan. So we have a smaller window right back here aft of the rear doors because this is just a cargo area. The clean lines continue out back where we find a minimum of chrome down here lower on the bumper, tail lamp modules that merge from the body on over to the hatch, a discrete 2 liter turbo badge indicating what engine's under the hood, dual exhaust lower on the bumper, and of course a trailer hitch receiver, optional. Depending on how you configure your Equinox, you can tow up to 3,500 pounds in this vehicle, which is a little bit below some entries like the Jeep Cherokee. Now it's worth noting that if you get the 1.6 liter diesel engine, towing capacity drops relatively significantly versus the two liter turbo. At the beginning of the 2018 model year, the Equinox was available only with a 1.5 liter turbocharged engine, and that's the engine that we drove at the launch event. The base engine produces 170 horsepower and a surprising 203 pound-feet of torque. It's mated to a standard six-speed automatic transmission, and you can get either front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Today we're driving the optional 2-liter turbo engine, which produces 252 horsepower and 260 pound-feet of torque, and has a surprisingly broad torque curve. Instead of using the same 6-speed auto that we see in the base model, this engine uses a brand new 9-speed automatic transmission designed by General Motors. This transmission shifts nothing like the 9-speed automatic that we see in the Jeep Cherokee. So if you've driven the Cherokee or some of the other Jeep products with their 9-speed automatic and you're worried about how this model behaves, don't worry, this is completely different. The difference is all down to the design of this 9-speed automatic and it's a little bit more traditional than what we see in the Chrysler products. Also available under this hood is a 1.6 liter turbo diesel four-cylinder engine that produces 137 horsepower and 240 pound-feet of torque. Unfortunately, that engine does not get the 9-speed automatic. It actually uses basically a stronger version of the 6-speed auto we find in the 1.5 liter engine. GM tells us that the reason they didn't use the 9-speed automatic with the diesel engine is that it didn't improve the EPA fuel economy numbers, which are very high for this segment at 32 miles per gallon combined. If you want to get better fuel economy than that, you will have to look for a hybrid from Nissan or from Toyota. Of course, most folks will be buying the 1.5 liter turbocharged engine and fuel economy should range between 25 and 26 miles per gallon combined. Now it is worth noting that all engines, the diesel and both gasoline engines, employ General Motors' latest automatic start-stop system and it cannot be user defeated. That means that if for some reason you really dislike the way auto start-stop systems behave, this may not be the right vehicle for you. 
in our front seat comfort score, I'm going to give this model 8 out of 10 points, primarily because we don't find a four-way adjustable lumbar support even in the top end trims. On the bright side, most of the Equinox models you'll see on the dealer lots will have a power driver's seat with the same two-way adjustable lumbar support that this seat has. Of course, base models still get a manual seat. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion. As we see in a number of other General Motors vehicles, the front passenger seat has the same range of motion as the driver's seat, and that's not something we see in all of the competition. Hopping in the back seat, we find one inch less combined legroom than we see in the Honda CRV. However, this is just about the same as we see in the Nissan Rogue, and actually one more than we get in the Toyota RAV4. That means that sitting right here behind myself, I still have several inches of legroom left. It also means that if I scoot all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, where I had a six foot five passenger sitting up front, I still have about two inches of legroom left. In a very nice touchback here, there is absolutely no hump for the rear seat passengers. And that means that sliding from one side of the rear bench seat to the other is very, very easy. And of course, that makes it more comfortable for an adult to sit in the middle seat because I don't have to straddle a hump with my feet. Headroom is generous in the outboard seating positions, but sitting right here in the middle seat, my head does brush the ceiling because the center seat is a little bit higher off the ground than the outboard seats. For a little bit of extra comfort, the seats offer two different recline positions. There's a slightly more upright position, and then we can adjust it to a little bit more of a recline. It's about one inch of overall movement. Because we're driving the top end trim of the Equinox, the rear console features heated seat controls for the outboard seating positions. You can choose to heat the whole seat or just the seat back. We also have two USB inputs, a 12 volt power port, and then a little bit lower there on the console where you can't see, we also have a 120 volt inverter outlet. Behind the optional power hatch, we find 28.9 cubic feet of storage space. That surprised me a little bit because this is notably smaller than the RAV4, the CRV, or the Rogue. Those are all right around 38 or 39 cubic feet of storage space. In fact, this cargo area managed to be actually a little bit smaller than the Hyundai Tucson, which is a smaller vehicle overall. That seems to be because General Motors has prioritized front and second row room overall a little bit above cargo capacity in the back. Now that said, approximately 29 cubic feet of cargo space is still a decent amount of cargo space. We had no problem fitting 24 inch roller bags back here or these 22 inch roller bags like this. They definitely fit in an upright position. Chevy also includes a few practical touches for helping you load cargo. The rear seats can be folded either from the second row right there or from the cargo area, and the rear seats fold completely flat with the cargo area in the back, easily allowing you to push luggage right there onto the seat backs. In addition to that, we find quite a large storage compartment right here under the cargo area load floor. You can see that right now the roof rails for this particular model are stored in this area. If we continue further down the rabbit hole, we find a donut spare tire under that section, and there's definitely enough room under the cargo area load floor to put a full-size spare tire if you wanted to aftermarket. As we take a look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end Premier trim, and we also have this large panoramic moonroof. This does cut down on headroom just a little bit, so if you're a taller person, you might want to consider skipping the moonroof. The driver and front passenger have fixed height seat belts and two-way adjustable headrests. The model that we're driving has perforated leather upholstery because these seats are both heated and ventilated in the front row and heated only in the rear row. As we see in a number of other Chevy products, the front doors feature a combination of plastics. We have a soft touch insert right here around the armrest and that section of the door. This upper portion right here has sort of a rubbery coating on it, making it feel a little bit softer than a simple hard plastic would. And then we have traditional hard plastics lower on the front door, for instance, right around that bottle holder. Moving over to the dashboard, we find basically that same combination of materials. Part of the reason that they put that coating on the upper section of the dashboard and on the doors is to reduce glare. Simple hard injection molded plastics tend to have a little bit more glare than ones that are coated like we see in this vehicle. We then have a soft touch center section right there and then hard plastics lower on the dashboard. On the passenger side, we find a bin style glove compartment. I was able to fit a smaller tablet computer in here, but larger ones may not fit. Because we're driving the Premier trim today, we have a center channel speaker up there and we have an 8 inch screen instead of the standard 7 inch screen that we find in other trims. This particular system features factory navigation, but all models of the Equinox come standard with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, whether we're talking about the 8 inch screen or the base 7 inch screen. There are a few physical buttons below, home button, back button, track forward, backward, and of course a power and volume knob, and then two large air vents on either side. Below the infotainment system, we find the controls for the dual zone automatic climate control and the controls for the heated and ventilated front seats. There's also an engine start stop button right over here to the left. 
Under the climate controls, we find two USB inputs, an auxiliary input, a 12 volt power port, and of course a wireless charging mat if your phone supports the standard. Continuing back from that, we have a tow mode button and then a fairly traditional console shifter. Low is all the way to the back, drive is one notch above that. When you're in the low mode, you can use the plus and minus buttons on top of the shifter to help command gear changes in the system. Now this is not a manual mode, this simply limits the maximum gear that the transmission will use. Behind that, there's an electric parking brake, and then to the right we have two very large cup holders. Between the front seats, we find a padded center armrest, and this opens to reveal a very large storage compartment, where we find an additional two USB ports if you'd rather not have your phone hanging out up front like mine was, and there's definitely enough room in here for larger items, including a gallon of milk. The instrument cluster is styled very similarly to other Chevy vehicles. We have black faces, white numbers, red needles, and a little bit of aqua-colored trim around certain areas. As I said before, we have auto start stop indicated right over here on the tachometer, and again, there is no user defeatable button inside this cabin. Between the two main dials, we find a color LCD screen that gives us things like our typical trip computer information. We also have audio system information, phone information. You can access certain navigation commands from this display as well, and the ability to change certain system options that relate mainly to the screen in front of you. The steering wheel is a three spoke design. It's leather wrapped in our models with sport grips up top. On the left side, we find the controls for the cruise control system, but again, this does not have radar adaptive cruise control. So this distance button that you see right here in the middle refers to the collision alert system and how sensitive you want it to be. You can see the readout right there in that color screen. We also have a button for the heated steering wheel and the lane keep assistance system. On the right side of the wheel, we have a phone button, voice command button, and then a button array that controls that multifunction LCD. You'll notice that there's no track forward and backward button on the face of the steering wheel or volume up and down. That's because they're on the back of the steering wheel like we see in other GM vehicles. We have track forward backward over here on the left and then volume up down on the back of the steering wheel over here on the right. One of the big reasons that we revisit vehicles like the Equinox after we've driven it at a launch event is because at the launch event we're often driving pre-production prototype vehicles. So not everything has been sorted out, the vehicles haven't been broken in, etc. It's also fairly common that not all of the engine choices are available immediately when a vehicle is launched. Fortunately, while we've had this Equinox, I was also able to get my hands on a 1.5 liter turbocharged model and a diesel model from a local dealership. In our official 0 to 60 testing, that 1.5 liter turbocharged model ran from 0 to 60 in 8.9 seconds, which was a surprising 6 tenths faster than the model that we tested at the launch event. Some of that could be climate, because of course the weather here in California is a little bit different, but I also suspect that further tuning was done to that model in order to help improve the 0 to 60 time. 8.9 seconds is of course a little bit slower than the average entry in this segment still, but that's where this 2 liter model steps in, because thanks to the extra power and the 9 speed automatic transmission, this ran from 0 to 60 in a shockingly quick 6.7 seconds. As I said earlier in the video, this 9 speed automatic transmission does not shift like the 9 speed that we find under the hood of certain Honda, Acura, Chrysler, Jeep, and even some Land Rover vehicles. That's because this is a General Motors designed 9 speed automatic, not one designed by ZF of Germany, which is what the other companies use. Because of the design of this 9 speed automatic transmission, shifts feel very, very normal, and that's not what's going on in the other 9 speed automatic. The shifts are also a little bit faster than we see in the 6 speed automatic, so this actually has a much more engaging feel, even though there are more gears to choose from. Downshifts are especially quick, which really help improve the passing ability of the Equinox. A lot of you on Facebook were asking about the diesel engine and whether or not it was faster than the 1.5 liter turbo. No it's not, because it doesn't produce as much power as the 1.5 liter turbo. Even though it does produce a healthy amount of torque, you need both torque and horsepower in order to get a good acceleration time. That model came in right around 10 seconds, 0 to 60. In our braking test, this model ran from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 116 feet, which is a very short stopping distance for this compact crossover category. You can thank the wide tires that we have on this top end Premier for that. If you were to get one of the base trims or mid-level trims of the Equinox, then that stopping distance will be a little bit longer. However, it will still be shorter than some of the competition because all models of the Equinox get 225 width tires tires, except for the Premier model, which gets 235 with tires. These are fairly wide overall for a crossover in this category. 
In addition to losing weight, the overall nature of the Equinox has become sportier in this generation, and that's why I'm going to give handling an A-. This still lacks the same kind of attention to detail when it comes to handling feel that we see in the Mazda CX-5, but in terms of overall handling ability, this actually is very close to that Mazda. The Equinox definitely has a more engaging feel to it than something like a Toyota RAV4, and this compares very well against the Ford Escape. Overall top end grip is a little bit better in the Kia Sportage, but I think that mainly has to do with the tire choice that we see in this model. So if you want to really improve your handling in your Equinox, just simply swap out the factory tires with something that's grippier, and you'll see a marked improvement. Chevy's decision to focus on handling ability for this generation of the Equinox does take a little bit of a toll on the ride. So when we get out here on a rougher gravel road, we definitely feel more of the small imperfections coming through into the cabin than we see in something like a RAV4 or a CRV. This is also notably firmer than the Nissan Rogue, which is the best-selling compact crossover in the US at the moment, and fairly similar to something like the Kia Sportage or certain versions of the Hyundai Tucson, which also have a slightly sportier mission in mind. Generally speaking, ride and handling are two ends of a teeter-totter. So when you improve one, you're going to decrease the other. So if you want a softer ride, you're going to have a little bit of a penalty when it comes to handling. If you want better handling, you're going to have a little bit of a penalty when it comes to ride. Out on a rougher paved road like this, the firmer suspension is definitely noticeable versus something like the Honda CRV. You'll definitely feel more of these potholes coming into the cabin. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, this vehicle scored 71 decibels, so I'm going to give this a B plus when it comes to cabin noise. Something like the Nissan Rogue and the Honda CRV are a little bit quieter than this, but this is quieter than some of the other compact crossovers in America. Even though Chevy chose to use a six-speed automatic transmission under the hood in the base model, instead of a continuously variable transmission, fuel economy is still very competitive in this segment. The EPA average fuel economy numbers for that base engine are two miles per gallon below the Honda CRV, but they're actually three above the Toyota RAV4, and fairly good when you compare it against something like the Tucson, the Sportage, or of course the Ford Escape. It's also worth noting that overall maintenance costs seem to be lower with GM's six-bit automatic transmissions than the continuously variable transmission that we see under the hood of the Nissan Rogue. The 2.0-liter turbo that we're driving here is obviously less efficient than the 1.5-liter turbo, but interestingly enough, this still scores the same average EPA score that we see in the Toyota RAV4, even though we get considerably more power out of this model. The efficiency of the Equinox is also noticeable when we compare this against comparably performing compact crossovers. For instance, the Kia Sportage with the 2.0-liter turbo engine will go from 0 to 60 just as fast as this model, but it definitely averages lower in terms of fuel economy. The Jeep Cherokee with the 3.6-liter V6 engine will go a little bit faster than this thanks to its very, very aggressive first gear in certain trims. However, the Cherokee is notably less efficient than the Equinox with the 2.0-liter turbo. If you want the most efficient Equinox, that would be the model equipped with the 1.6-liter diesel engine, and in steady-state highway cruising, that model does get over 40 miles per gallon with relative ease. If your commute involves a lot of steady-state highway driving, the Equinox is going to be one of the most efficient options in America for you, because this is going to get better fuel economy overall out on the highway than a RAV4 hybrid or a Nissan Rogue hybrid. If, on the other hand, you have a more average commute or you spend a great deal of time in city driving or in stop-and-go traffic, then one of the hybrids is likely going to be less expensive to operate overall. You also need to keep in mind that diesel is, of course, more expensive than regular gasoline in the United States, and you will have to fill the urea tank in this vehicle with diesel exhaust fluid about every five to 6,000 miles. Our week-long average in this model, which is a 2.0-liter front-wheel drive model, has been 26.5 miles per gallon, which is a little bit better than the EPA says we should get, and that really impressed me. That's thanks primarily to the 9-speed automatic transmission, which really helps keep engine revs low when you're out on the highway. Now, it is worth noting that this 9-speed automatic loves to keep those engine revs very, very low, even when you're lugging the engine just a little bit. That means that in some situations, we can get a little bit of exhaust note reverb into the cabin that we don't see in vehicles that are more aggressive with their downshifting. But I think that's a reasonable price to pay for the improved fuel economy that we see in this model. The result is that in terms of overall fuel cost, you'd actually have to average several miles per gallon better in this vehicle than a Toyota RAV4 hybrid for this to be less expensive to operate than the Toyota. Chevy has definitely changed the personality of the Equinox for 2018, and if I were shopping for an Equinox, I would definitely get this 2.0-liter engine and the 9-speed automatic transmission. For 2018, the L trim of the Equinox starts at 23580 but there are a few things you need to know about the L trim. The color options are pretty limited in that model compared to the rest of the lineup. You also don't find a number of the features that we see in the other trims, and there are no options that you can select. 
In addition to that, you're really not likely to see that many L trims hanging out on dealer lots. The realistic base point for the Equinox is the $25,600 point for the LS trim that gives you things like XM satellite radio, the ability to choose certain options on the vehicle, and of course, the floor mats in the back. If you want to select the 2 liter turbocharged engine or the 1.6 liter turbo diesel engine, you have to step up to the LT trim. In kind of an interesting twist, the Equinox's LT trim and the Premier trim are both available with all three engines. So you can choose whether you want the more fuel efficient 1.5 liter turbo, the diesel 1.6 liter turbo, or the more performance oriented 2 liter turbo and 9 speed automatic. The model we were driving this week was the top end Premier 2 liter turbo trim, which started at $33,600. On the surface of things, that appears to be an almost $3,000 upgrade over the 1.5 liter base engine. However, we do get the upgraded wheels, upgraded tires, upgraded brakes, and of course the dual exhaust. And it all factors into that extra price increase versus the base model. Now let's move on to the takeaways. The first takeaway obviously is that, as I said before, the base L trim is definitely the base base trim. They've stripped out a bunch of things in order to help give it that low sticker price. But if you want to be able to choose options or add some of those other features to your vehicle, you have to step up to the LS trim. Now that said, the 1.5 liter turbocharged engine and six speed automatic is standard in all models. And that's not something we see in all of the competition. Even the Honda CRV, which has been pushing their 1.5 liter turbo very hard, does not have that engine in the base Honda CRV. The base CRV actually uses a naturally aspirated 2.4 liter engine. So this is a win for the Chevy on the base turbocharged engine. In fact, all three engines available are turbo engines. Speaking of engines, of course, the 1.6 liter diesel is really an interesting option here because at the moment, it is the only diesel in this segment. Volkswagen no longer sells one, and Mazda has not been able to get theirs approved for sale in the United States yet, although we do expect to see it in the CX-5 at some point. The Equinox has a generous passenger area in the back and a fairly generous cargo area, but it's not as big as some of the class leaders in this segment, so that is something to keep in mind. You will be able to fit an awful lot more cargo in the Honda CR-V, the Toyota RAV4, or the Nissan Rogue especially. If you're looking for one of the 2 liter turbos in this segment, then the Equinox is definitely a strong competitor here because of that 9 speed automatic transmission. We get performance that is equaling some of the best in this particular segment, yet we get fuel economy that's actually much better than, say, the 2 liter turbo in the Kia Sportage. Now let's talk about the competition. First up, we have the top dog, which is the Honda CRV in this segment. The CRV is one of the most popular crossovers in America for a number of very good reasons. It's comfortable, it's well priced, there's a huge cargo area in the back, about 10 cubic feet more than we find in the Equinox. And we also have more legroom in the back seat than we find in the Chevy, even though overall it is a slightly more compact package. The 1.5 liter turbocharged engine and continuously variable transmission deliver excellent 0 to 60 performance and excellent fuel economy. Although the CVT is not quite as engaging as a traditional automatic like we find in the Equinox. Of course, that 1.5 liter turbo is not standard in the CRV, and if you do get the base 2.4 liter engine, then performance is a decent amount below the mainstream models of that Honda. But Honda fights back in most trims with a big dedication to active safety. If you're looking at the EX trim or above, not only is that 1.5 liter turbo engine standard, Honda's latest active safety systems called Honda Sensing are also standard. That means we get radar adaptive cruise control, the autonomous braking, pre-collision warning, etc. The result overall is that the CRV is a very, very good value in this segment. It also has one of the best put together interiors. The interior, I think, is definitely a semi-step above what we're seeing in the Equinox in terms of overall design as well as parts quality. Next up, we have the Toyota RAV4. At 24510 the RAV4 is a little bit more expensive than the Equinox. But the price difference is easy to explain because the RAV4 now includes standard in all trims Toyota's latest active safety package, which includes, again, radar adaptive cruise control, their auto high beam system, pre-collision warning, etc. Now, it's worth noting that aside from bundling that package in all models of the RAV4, relatively little has been done with the RAV4 over time, and as a result, it is one of the older models in the segment. Fuel economy definitely falls below the Chevy Equinox, as does handling and the overall appearance of the interior and the exterior in my book. On the plus side for the RAV4, it has proved to be very reliable and its cargo area is very, very generous, but it just comes across as being just a little bit too old. And that's why we're expecting to see a brand new Toyota RAV4 coming up later this year. It probably will be on sale around November or December in 2018, as far as we're seeing right now. None of that is official yet, of course. 
Next up, we have the Nissan Rogue, which is also one of the best-selling compact crossovers in America. The Rogue does very well when it comes to overall interior comfort, whether we're talking about front seat comfort or second seat comfort. It also has a very large and accommodating cargo area when compared to the average entry in the compact crossover segment. Fuel economy is also very high, but all models do use a continuously variable transmission. There is an available Nissan Rogue Hybrid that will give you slightly better fuel economy in some driving situations versus the Toyota RAV4 Hybrid, but the Rogue Hybrid is always going to use a traditional continuously variable transmission, so that could be a reliability pain point versus what we see in the Toyota RAV4. On the flip side, of course, the Rogue Hybrid will have exactly the same kind of all-wheel drive performance as a regular Rogue because it does use a traditional mechanical all-wheel drive system. Last up, we have the Ford Escape, which at this point is one of the older compact crossovers in this group in America. Over the last few years, Ford has given the Escape a few tweaks here and there, but it does come across as one of the older entries just like the Toyota RAV4. When compared against the Equinox, the Chevy does have a little bit more legroom in the back, but the Ford actually has more cargo room behind that second row. When it comes to handling, the Escape does very well, but it doesn't do quite as well as the Equinox, especially when we're taking a look at top-end trims. Chevy really did an excellent job making the Equinox one of the best handling compact crossovers that you can buy. It's right up there with things like the Mazda CX-5 in terms of overall handling feel, and right up there with the Kia Sportage and perhaps the Hyundai Tucson Sport in terms of overall grip. The all-turbocharged engine lineup is also a little bit interesting because we don't see that in the Ford Escape at this time, as is the 1.6-liter diesel. At the moment, my top pick in this segment has to continue to be the Honda CRV. It's just an excellent all-around compact crossover. There are a number of reasons that you might want to get the Equinox over the Honda CRV, especially if you can get a really good deal on one at your Chevy dealer, but overall my top pick again still has to be that Honda. It's worth noting, of course, that if you spend a great deal of time out on the highway, especially steady state highway driving, the 1.6 liter diesel in the Equinox is going to give you the best fuel economy in this segment. It simply cannot be beat even by the gasoline hybrids that we see from Nissan or from Toyota in terms of that steady state highway driving. Now, in terms of in-city stop and go driving, you're going to find better fuel economy in the hybrids, but for the long distance highway situation, definitely the Equinox is the way to go. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure and click that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. You can also head over to patreon.com if you want to support this channel, and I hope you do. Head over to facebook.com slash so you can see what we're driving this week, and I'll see you later.